Dave, Chris Russo, how are you today, pal? I'm doing good, Chris. Thanks for having no, me. Great to have you. Great to have you here. First off, how about this new role? You're going to replace Justice. What exactly are you going to do here now for Yes? Well, I, I think John Filippelli gave me a, a, a great uh, a great chance just to kind of jump in and do a little bit of both, a little bit of booth work, a little bit of studio work, and maybe help with a couple of the shows that they put together. But uh, for the most part, it's it's a pretty flexible schedule. It's a part time schedule, and it's uh, just perfect timing because I live up in Connecticut, and uh, the Yes Studio is right there in Connecticut. I, uh, do you can you make the transition, Dave? I mean, uh, you always were a no nonsense, you know, straight shooter type of guy. You've been out of the game now for about four or five years. Could you? Can you make the transition? Position of, you know, being a guy who at times has to criticize a performer, a performance, a team. Can you do that here? Is you're gonna to have to do that at times. Can you handle that? Well, yeah, you know, I understand you have to you have to uh, be cognizant of uh, being credible, and you have to tell the truth when the truth needs to be told, and that's for sure. Uh, that's something that I, you know, that I need to learn. I don't I don't come in with any pretense of uh, of being a professional journalist, you know, but uh, certainly I think as an analyst, I can uh, I can tell you something you don't know uh, throughout the course of a game. And my relationship with the new manager Joe Girardi certainly is is a big impact uh, point. on yeah. my decision. Yeah. So, so I, I, you know, I understand what you're saying, dog. You know, at times it's going to be tough, but uh, you know, you know, if I can tell you something you don't know during the game, uh, you know, here and there, I feel like I'm doing a pretty and good how job. How do you think Girardi? We'll get to Santana in a sec, Dave. How do you think Girardi will he will he will he fill, uh, you know, uh, jump in like an old shoe? How will you? How do you handle Girardi? How do you think Girardi will fit in here uh, with his, you know, after touring and everything else? How do you feel Joe's first year is going to be? Well, I, you know, I, I think Joe's gonna gonna come right in and try to establish his own style. You know, he's certainly a Tory protege, so to speak. But I know he wants to wants to develop his own identity, and uh, yeah, I, I think he's gonna gain a lot of respect from the veterans right away because he, even though he was their teammate and he's a young guy, I think they all respected Joe and the role he played as a catcher. And uh, you know, certainly I think you know he's gonna have to try to establish his own identity early on. And and uh, you know, with, with with due respect to Joe Tory, it's a tough spot to come in following Joe Tory. Very hard, and he's got a year under his belt. He did a good job. Of that Marlins team, but you know, a lot of people think he's got a little Buck Showalter in him, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But you know, Buck can get a little bit of a controlling theme going, and maybe Joe's got a little Buck in him. Give me—I mean, he's a Navy guy. You know, so, uh, he's got a little Navy background. Give me your thoughts about Joe being a little too strict with this veteran ball club. Give me your thoughts about that. Well, yeah, that's going to be an interesting, uh, you know, thing to play out early on, and you know how he interacts with the players. But I, I think Joe's obviously a very intelligent guy. He's very well prepared. The thing that I liked about him as a catcher was that even though he he, he tried to get as much information as he could, he was an information hound as far as stats. He didn't try to force it on guys, and he understood what guys could handle information, what guys couldn't. And but he always had the background information going into any game, and that's the way he's going to manage. And you know, I think he handles it well. He doesn't. Over, he doesn't overly push it. Uh, Jabba Chamberlain, would you let him start the season in a rotation? Or if you're the manager with the Yankee having a huge eighth inning hole there, would you leave Chamberlain alone in the eighth inning? What's your take on that? Well, it's a nice problem to have when you've got a young flamethrower and all that talent. Uh, that, that your biggest problem is uh, whether to start him or, or, or keep him in the end of games. Uh, certainly, the end of games and the setup role is much more important than it used to be. I, I, used to, I always used to say you know, that the starting pitching was the most important thing, but I think the game has changed, and I think we saw the same thing play out with Papelbon in Boston. So it's kind of interesting to see how they play this. Well, out. I'll tell you right now, I think the Yankees are making a mistake thinking he should be in that starting rotation. They do have Musina there, so they can go Kennedy. And and Pettit and Wong, Mucina, and Hughes. They can use, let Mucina be like a fifth starter. He's a competitive guy, Mucina. He's probably embarrassed by last year. May come back and pitch a little better. Maybe his last season. And they have a, I don't like Farnsworth. I think they're better off of allowing Jabba to be in the eighth inning, Dave. I think it makes more sense for the ball club. Give me your thoughts there. Well, it's hard. To, it's hard to argue with that. Uh, certainly, especially with the with the uh, experience in that role that he got last year and the success. Really, he was he was lights out numbers wise, and uh, certainly gave the the Yankees a whole different dimension when they got a lead in the game, especially late, that you knew he was down there. So, you know, it's two ways to go. You can groom him for the eventual closers role as Mariano uh, winds down his career, or you can take a shot in the starting rotation. You know what you're getting in the bullpen because you saw what you can get from him in the bullpen last year. You still don't know what he's going to be like as a starter. Uh, we you be worried if well, what would be your advice to Wong 
you know, nobody really can get into his head at all. Language issues, the whole bit. You know, he was terrible for the Yankees in the postseason. He had terrible, two terrible starts. He's the biggest reason why Torres not here. Uh, I don't know. I mean, what would be your advice to Wong off what happened to him in those two games against the Indians if you were a Yankee pitching coach? Well, I th my advice to Wong would be to, to be to continue to develop his craft. He needs to develop that third pitch, a change up. He needs to use his breaking ball more. I think, you know, his sinker is so dominating that sometimes he falls in love with it. And on days when it's not sinking, which we saw a lot of in the middle of the season, that you're going to have other pitches you're going to have to go to. And you know, you have to develop your craft. You have to develop those third and fourth pitches for those days when that sinker's not sinking. And, and that's what I would concentrate on spring training. With How him. about psychologically? Do we know enough about the kid to bounce back? I mean, sometimes those kind of outings can take. A a long time to get over. How about from a psychological standpoint? Well, they can. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, it, it, you would hope that the, that wouldn't have any lingering effect, but, uh, you know, as a young kid still, really, it, it's hard to read. But, uh, you yeah, know, I would anticipate that he would bounce back.